Howdy. In this video, we're going to take up something called collision theory, uh, which essentially involves using some of the understanding we have about uh, collision frequencies and the like uh, to put together models for how rate constants for chemical reactions should behave. Uh, I think I mentioned before that when I was uh, looking at what to cut down uh, from uh, the course content to make up for the time that we lost, uh, one of my first thoughts was that I, I wanted to keep this part of chapter seven in, in, uh, in the class uh, because I think it's a, a notion that doesn't come up as much in say an engineering presentation of kinetics uh, as it will here. Uh, and I think it'll help give you a sort of more, uh, <clears throat> more rounded view of things uh, if I'm right about that other part. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by developing uh, an equation for the collision frequency between two dissimilar molecules. Uh, if you think back to what we did in chapter six, we have an equation for the collision frequency for molecules of a particular type of gas, just a, a homogeneous gas essentially, where there's only one kind of molecule. Uh, in order to look at most chemical reactions, we have to entertain the possibility that the molecules reacting might be different substances, uh, and therefore they'll be different sizes, travel with different speeds, things like that. All of those factors will influence the collision frequency. So the basic argument in collision theory is this. Uh, it says, if I'm gonna have two molecules uh, react with one another, we're still treating our molecules like hard spheres here, right? Molecule A, molecule B. Uh, if I want those two things to react, maybe they're gonna make molecule C or whatever, uh, the minimum requirement for that is gonna be that they have to actually physically collide with one another. In other words, we're saying they can't react at a distance. Uh, I can't have this molecule over here just like shake off a piece of itself and throw it over here uh, to have my reaction get going. Okay, they're going to have to physically come in contact. That's a reasonable uh, place to start in thinking about what needs to happen for two molecules to react. Because of that, if that's the minimum requirement, then the maximum reaction rate would just be uh, the rate of collisions. So if I knew the collision frequency, uh, I could do, uh, take that and use it to get a, a rate constant, right? Because the number of times they collide, uh, if that's the maximum number of reactions, then that'll get me a maximum rate. That's the, uh, what we're going to start out with here today. Equation we had derived earlier looked like this, right? So this is uh, labeled ZAA over there, where the AA piece uh, reminds us uh, that this is for molecule A colliding with a different molecule A, right? So they're the same species. Uh, and in that equation, uh, we have uh, a sigma. Remember that sigma piece in there? That was equal to pi d squared, uh, where d was the diameter of the molecule. Uh, this piece, my square root of two is in there uh, because that was supposed to make us get the relative speed of approach or the average relative speed of approach for two molecules. The one half on the front was there because we didn't want to count the same collision twice, right? Uh, because every time I had a collision, there were two a's involved, right? And so I didn't want to double count. And that's where that one half came from. And then the n over v on the end, uh, that's the number density of the gas. It's squared because I need two molecules in order to have my collision, right? So it's gonna uh, go as the, the concentration or that number density squared, okay? In order to adjust this to think about a, b collisions, we're gonna have to play with some of those parameters, okay? Uh, a fancy way of saying the things that we're gonna do is to say we're gonna picture the collision that's happening in a center of mass coordinate system, uh, where at the moment the molecules are colliding, the center of mass is the point of collision, right? Uh, and so uh, that's gonna to lead to some of the things we're gonna declare. We're not really gonna develop it that way. Uh, we're just gonna say, well, these things will account for various uh, effects uh, and, and make things work out. But if you want to do this more formally, that's how you go about it. To switch to AB collisions, there's a few things we have to change. Number one is that one half in front is going to change because now uh, AB versus BA collisions, those are, those are two different things, right? If this is A and that's B, they hit each other, right? If this is A and that's B, that's a separate collision, okay? Uh, so counting every collision now between an A and a B is not double counting. Uh, so the half will go. The speed piece, where we had the square root of two times the average speed for the average relative speed in our AA equation, uh, for this one, we're gonna use the expression for the average speed, but instead of the mass of one molecule, we're gonna put in the reduced mass for the collision pair, okay? Again, that reduced mass is like thinking about things in that center of mass coordinate system. 
Uh, remember the reduced mass, which we worked with when we were talking about uh, rotation and vibration and partition functions. Uh, the reduced mass is the product of the two masses uh, divided by the sum of the two masses, right? So if we put that in, then we're still going to have that square root of, uh, what, uh, square root of 8kt over pi m uh, is still going to be my average speed, except the m is now going to get changed to a mu for that reduced mass. The other thing that's going to be different is my cross-section. If we look at the picture over here, uh, to get a collision to happen between A and B, now A and B presumably in almost all cases will have different diameters. Okay, uh, The original equation was, was pi d squared because the two molecules were the same. Right? If we think about my collision point here, uh, this is the point at which the things are just barely going to nick each other as they pass by. Right? The centers are apart by a radius from each molecule. So instead of, uh, if those two radii were the same, we could add them together and get D. Uh, well, now we've got two different radii, right? So we're gonna say what we need instead of a D is we need RA plus RB uh, in there, because that's gonna be this radius up here from molecule A, together with that radius down there uh, from molecule B. Take that and put it in where we used to have D, and we'll get that expression for our new collision cross-section uh, for an AB collision pair. And then lastly, over here, we have the number density squared. Uh, that was because that was the concentration or the, the number of things of each collision partner around. Uh, so that means that uh, each of those gets replaced with a term one for A and one for B, because the two number densities now would be independent, right? I could have a gas that was mostly A with just a trace of B uh, or the other way around. Uh, and either way, I should be able to calculate my collision number. So those are all the things we have to fix up uh, to turn this equation from AA into AB. And when we do that, uh, we get something that looks like what's on the slide now. So uh, this just says, this is, uh, I took out the one half, right? Uh, I still have my sigma and my, uh, my V bar there, the average speed and the cross section. Uh, on the next version, it looks like I flipped the sequence of terms for some reason, but this one, that's the speed piece, right? Because that's the square root of eight uh, KT over pi mu uh, and then uh, mu just replaces m. This one is the cross section, now in terms of the radii of a and b, and then these are my two number densities, all right? So that's the collision frequency, right? If every collision uh, reacted, ended up causing a reaction to take place, then our rate of reaction would be some maximum value of the rate constant, labeled here as k2, because it's a second order rate constant if our reaction takes place in this bimolecular collision. Okay, so we're thinking about a bimolecular elementary step here, if we want to like use some proper uh, kinetic language. Uh, I want that maximum rate constant times the concentration of A and the concentration of B, all right? Those concentrations we're going to replace with the number densities. Uh, they're just numbers of molecules per unit volume, right? If you think about the concentrations perhaps normally being in molarity, moles is a number of molecules, uh, liters is a volume, so that's N over V. Uh, so that says those two things are going to become the number densities, which means they come, these pieces are the concentrations. That means everything else that's in there, the rest of this thing, this part, is now going to be what I'm calling K2 max. Okay, so on the bottom here, I get this uh, equation, which says the hypothetical maximum value of that second order rate constant should be that average relative speed times the collision cross section. All right, uh, and if every collision causes a reaction to take place, then that thing times the two concentrations or the two number densities should get me a reaction rate. To get started and do a little bit of calculating here, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna work out uh, the value of that K2 max uh, for a second order uh, reaction between NO and Cl2, making NOCl nitrosyl chloride, I guess that is, uh, and a chlorine atom uh, at uh, 298 Kelvin, so near room temperature. We have on there the collision cross sections for each molecule alone. Uh, if you look up values for any of these cross sections, as you readily imagine, uh, it's much easier to tabulate values that are just for one molecule instead of trying to tabulate for every possible pair. So oftentimes we'll have to work from the ones we start off with uh, and go back from those to get the radii so we can put them together to reformulate the cross section we need. Okay, uh, so we're going to do a couple things here. The first up is I'm going to start by finding the reduced mass. I haven't done that for a while. 
but the reduced mass is going to be uh, what? Uh, the mass of the NO, uh, which happens to be about 30. I'm going to write it down here with some decimal places, I guess, uh, times the mass of the Cl2, uh, which is 70.9. So these are an AMU. And then on the bottom, I'm going to have the sum of those two things. Multiply that out, and it gives me my notes claim 21.085 in AMU. Uh, turn that into kilograms, uh, and that'll give me 3.5 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. That's my reduced mass for this NO and Cl2 pair, all right? I'm gonna need that in the calculation. The other thing I'm gonna need is I'm gonna to need to get from those cross sections to uh, the cross section for, or at least the radii for the individual molecules, okay? Uh, so let's say that uh, I could write for one of those uh, that the original equation said that sigma, the ones we have, are equal to pi d squared, okay? Uh, that says that uh, d, will be equal to the square root of sigma over pi. And that gives me that r will be equal to 1 half times the square root of sigma over pi, where the sigma here again is the, the cross section for collisions of that one type of molecule. So if I come down here, I'll work out the two of those. Uh, I'll say, oops, I'll say for Cl2, I should get that it's equal to one half times the square root of my cross section, which is 0 0.93, that's a nine, uh, in nanometers squared uh, over pi. And if I multiply that out, uh, the notes say I get, er, I don't know why it does that. Uh, you'd think I'd be better at this by now, but I'm not. 0.272 nanometers. Okay, it's really misbehaving on me now. Uh, and if I do the same thing for the NO, uh, the notes claim I end up with 0.182 nanometers. I swear I'm writing all the lines. Okay, so that gives me my two radii uh, that I'm going to use to find the uh, the cross section for the uh, the collision pair. Uh, with all that in place, I'm ready to set up my actual uh, collision uh, equation. Okay, uh, my equation says that I want uh, what I want. K2 uh, max, and I want that to be equal to uh, square root of 8K. I'm going to try and be good and put Bs on those because I've got the other K lurking around now. Uh, do be careful about that if you're taking notes or looking at things that you don't get Boltzmann's constant and a rate constant confused with each other. Uh, I've got that, and then I've got my cross section, which is now pi uh, r uh, no plus r cl2, and the distances are squared in there. In all these things, we're still treating both molecules as if they're hard spheres, okay? So we're just going with a radius to describe them, uh, ignoring the fact that this, these molecules, for example, would not actually be spherical uh, if we could, could uh, look at them. Uh, let's just put in the numbers and see what we get for this. Uh, we're going to get here, we're going to get 8. Uh, Boltzmann's constant is 1.38, 10 to the minus 23. Uh, that's in joules per Kelvin. Temperature is in as 298 Kelvin. On the bottom, we have pi. And we have a term that was 3.5 times 10 
to the minus 26th power, and that was in kilograms. Ah, that really did say a K kilograms. Uh, all that's in a square root. And then over here, I've got a piece which is pi times the sum of those radii, uh, which is 0.272 plus 0.182. Uh, and those are both in nanometers and that's squared. And then all that closes up. Uh, and according to my notes, if I multiply all that out, uh, it says here that I get about 3.54. My iPad is writing really strangely here. Uh, times 10 to the minus 19. And that's in meters cubed per second because we have everything in our equation up there in SI units, okay? Uh, if you wanted to, we could change that into more normal uh, rate constant units. So we could say that 3.5, I apologize for the writing, uh, but it's really just not behaving times 10 to the minus 19. And I'm in meters cubed over seconds. Uh, I would multiply that by, uh, let's say, Avogadro's number to get me into uh, per mole. times 10, come on, to the 23rd. That's got units of one over moles. Uh, then I have to get myself from meters cubed. I wanna get myself from meters cubed into liters. So I want to say that uh, I would have 10 to the third liters in one meter cubed. And if I multiply those out, I would get uh, 2.13, come on, I wrote a three there. times 10 to the eighth and that would be in liters on the top over moles and seconds on the bottom okay uh, those units would have the same uh, dimensions as being uh, what concentration over time right because that would be moles per liter for molarity. Over seconds on the bottom for the time. Uh, rearrange that a little bit and you get the same set of units down here, okay? Uh, so that's our value for the maximum in this, uh, this uh, second order rate constant for that particular pair of things. I want to tie this together with the ideas from the Arrhenius equation, okay? You've seen the Arrhenius equation before in, in GenCam, if nowhere else. Uh, and again, many of you have taken uh, your, or, or are taking your department's kinetics class. Uh, the Arrhenius equation tells us how rate constants change with temperature, right? Our collision rate, our collision theory equation there for that rate constant says that uh, it's, the collision frequency is proportional to the square root of T, 
Uh, that's a relatively slow dependence on temperature. Reaction rates generally go up much more strongly than that, right? Uh, there's a rule of thumb in people that do kinetics uh, that says that for a lot of reactions with typical activation energies, uh, if you raise the temperature by 10 degrees C, you might double the rate of reaction. Okay, that's a, a, obviously a strong dependence. Uh, typically, we express that in the Arrhenius equation written down here uh, as rate constant K uh, is uh, some pre-exponential factor, which I wrote here as A. Uh, some textbooks would call that a nu because it's got frequency units, uh, at least for first order rate constants, uh, times e to the minus e sub a over RT, where e sub a is the activation energy, right? What that activation energy means physically is it says that's the minimum collision energy required to enable the reaction to go forward, right? So it says two molecules can't just barely tap one another and react. Uh, if we're going to break a piece off of one of them, for example, the collision is going to have to have some violence to it, right? Uh, so they're going to have to come together with an energy above some threshold. So what this amounts to is it's imposing an additional requirement uh, on top of our first uh, guess that says, well, the minimum is they have to touch each other. Now we're saying they don't just have to collide, they have to collide hard, uh, and each reaction gets its own definition of what it means to be hard, what is a violent collision, okay? That pre-exponential factor will include the collision rate, uh, the part we just calculated, uh, and then uh, a possible steric factor, which we'll talk about some as the video goes along. Okay, so essentially our first guess, our k max, uh, that's what would happen if in this equation we took E sub A, the activation energy, and set it to zero. So there is no minimum energy required, they just have to hit each other, right? Then my uh, rate constant goes to what we're now calling the pre-exponential factor, uh, and that should be the thing we calculated from the collision rate, okay? Uh, oh, I put in one of these uh, sort of uh, no longer clicking clicker questions, but what does it say? How many of the following factors contribute to the fact that rate constants increase with increasing temperature? Okay, uh, and I'll go down the list. Uh, you can pause and, and read through them uh, if you like. The activation energy decreases as T increases. The activation energy shouldn't really be a function of temperature. Uh, and so that one is not, uh, not an actual true statement. It's not a factor that is in play. The total number of collisions increases as T increases. Uh, if we go back and look at our uh, Z equation, uh, we'll see that it has T to the one half on the top of it. So the total number of collisions does increase as temperature increases. Uh, so that one is, is definitely in play. Uh, the fraction of collisions that successfully lead to reaction increases as T increases. If I have a non-zero activation energy, which we in general almost always do, uh, then that one is also going to be a, a, a true statement and a factor that, that is operational here. It's actually going to be the most important one. Concentration of the reactive molecules increases as T increases. That doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, concentration uh, is number of molecules uh, over volume, and changing the temperature doesn't necessarily change those things. Uh, that means uh, I have to pick two here for this one in my, uh, my answering of the questions. Next up, we're going to talk about this uh, so-called steric factor. Uh, what this is, is it says molecules are not really hard spheres, right? Molecules have things that uh, many molecules at least give them directionality. Uh, and not all collisions are going to be equally effective. Uh, one way to think about this is that uh, we could have this so-called impact parameter, uh, which would come into play, right? Which says that uh, maybe a collision that just barely nudges each other and, and is a glancing blow kind of thing doesn't work, but a collision that is head on uh, will work much better, right? Uh, and so, uh, that can be developed into this, uh, what is usually referred to as an impact parameter, where in the case on the left here, where my molecules, the centers are online, uh, at, on the same line as the relative speed, uh, that's going to be a head-on collision, for lack of a, a more uh, technical term for it. In that case, uh, B is equal to zero. My impact parameter is zero, uh, because they're not off-center at all, right? Suppose the trajectory of our molecules is like this. The two uh, velocity vectors are here. The line of centers is not along the relative, uh, uh, the, the direction of those velocity vectors, right? They're still gonna hit, uh, but they're not gonna hit uh, with the same, uh, same kind of collision. Uh, it's gonna be more of a glancing blow, right? This one's gonna come in and hit there and deflect off that way, uh, something like that, right? Uh, and so in this case, my relative velocity is greater than my center to center velocity. Uh, and that collision in many cases might be less effective uh, than the one that is more head on. 
Another thing that comes into play in these steric factors is that molecules have geometries, right? Uh, they're not the same from all directions and depends on the molecule how true that is, right? Uh, but let's take the reaction on the left there. There's a couple of different cartoons in here that are taken from, uh, from different sources, actually, I believe. Uh, on the left, we have one which says it's hydrogen iodide reacting with a chlorine atom. Uh, so it's really just going to be uh, exchanging those halogens, right? Uh, so I'm going to take the HI, uh, the, chlor the chlorine is going to trade places with the iodide, uh, give me HCl plus I atom. Well, as you might expect, uh, that HI molecule has two ends to it. Right? One end is the hydrogen, one end is the iodine. The iodine is a much bigger target. Uh, but if the chlorine hits the iodine end, it's not going to be able to pluck off the hydrogen, right? Because it's actually not making any contact with the hydrogen. Uh, it's going to be hard to form an HCl bond uh, if the H is not in physical contact and proximity with that hydrogen, okay? So in this case, uh, my chlorine atom presumably would have to come in from the end uh, that is where the hydrogen is. Uh, and the picture there draws this cone that says uh, the chlorine atom is going to have to approach from a direction that's in that little scope of directions in order to have this reaction work. If my chlorine atom comes from over here, uh, it's pretty clearly going to fail, right? If it comes from this way, that's also not going to work because it's not going to ever get close to the hydrogen uh, in that arrangement, okay? Uh, if I were to look at a reaction like this one, uh, my uh, CO and O2 reacting to make CO2 and oxygen. This reaction is not very fast at the gas phase unless the temperature is really high, by the way. Uh, but if it were going to take place where you had a high enough temperature, say, to allow this reaction, uh, the collision on top where my oxygen molecule hits the oxygen end of the CO, that's unlikely to let it uh, react, right? Uh, because after all, I'm trying to get the carbon to attach itself to a second oxygen. Right? trying to form a carbon-oxygen bond. So most likely, I'm going to have to do something like this, where the oxygen atom strikes that carbon atom, so I get some intimate contact between the carbon and the oxygen, enough for them to be able to start to form a bond. That bond forming will stretch out and eventually break the OO bond, and the other oxygen atom can leave. Right? So in that case, uh, gosh, as a first crude guess of what my, uh, my geometric factor here might be, I might think that, well, something maybe on the order of half of all the collisions would have a chance to work uh, because CO, the carbon and oxygen, are at least close to the same size, right? So I might say, well, something like half the time it's coming from the oxygen side of things. Uh, and so that would give me a rough guess of what I thought that, uh, that, that geometric factor might be. Okay. Anything like this that's in play will reduce my reaction rate, right? So it will shrink that steric factor down uh, from there. If I take that steric factor and put it into my uh, equation, what I will get is something that looks like this, right? It says now my rate uh, is equal to, this is my collision uh, frequency here, right? Uh, it just tells me uh, what are the number of collisions. Written in there as a P is this steric factor. Uh, that's going to take on values, uh, as, as we presume, uh, first guess we'd say one just means they hit each other, uh, less than one means they don't all hit each other uh, in the right arrangement, right? So that should shrink from one uh, as uh, things, uh, things go from there. And then I've got my Arrhenius piece with the activation energy, that's the energy requirement, right? All of those things together should make the rate and be equal to this, right? If I take that uh, and look at how I calculated my K2 max before, effectively what I've done is I've said my rate, second order rate constant is now K2 max, it's got my steric factor, and then it's got my uh, energy requirement, uh, my, my activation barrier in there, right? And then I expand that to have all the terms filled in over here. What this does is it says that my pre-exponential piece in this formulation now has a t to the one-half dependence in it, right? Because it's got this piece there. Right? When we work uh, in simplest terms, work with the Arrhenius equation, like freshman chemistry version of the Arrhenius equation, we pretty much always say the pre-exponential part doesn't depend on temperature. The temperature dependence is all in the uh, activation energy. And that's not that bad a thing to say because t to the one-half is a very weak dependence compared to e to the t, uh, which is essentially what's going on in the activation energy piece, right? Uh, but a more correct treatment uh, tells us there is some temperature dependence in that, that pre-exponential factor as well. And that's what shows up uh, in this, this equation that we're looking at now. I think 
Uh, gosh, I dread this a little bit after how the writing went, but maybe it will have fixed itself. Uh, we're going to now uh, go ahead and calculate uh, what would be uh, given, what, oh, I'm, given an activation energy, we're gonna calculate the rate constant uh, at one temperature, okay? Uh, so I've said the activation energy for this reaction, we're taking as 85 kilojoules per mole, uh, and then we wanna find the second order rate constant at uh, 298K, okay? Uh, and we can do that uh, armed with what we have here, I think, so let's try it. Uh, we have uh, that uh, K2, gosh, I didn't give myself another thing to write on, so we'll have to, make this work. K2 is equal to K2 max uh, times steric factor P, which here I'm taking as one, times E to the minus E sub A over RT. All right. Uh, when I take this, uh, I know that K2 max, we found this one in the previous example, uh, and it was 3.54 times 10 to the minus 19. That's in meters cubed per second. Okay. Uh, so I know those things. Uh, I'm just going to put in uh, everything into this equation. I'm going to say that my K2 now is equal to that value. 3.54 times 10 to the minus 19. That's in meters cubed per second. That's from the previous example. I'm gonna put in a one for my steric factor because that's what it says up in my problem statement. And now I'm gonna set up my exponential piece. I need an E, E to the minus, and I have to make sure that I make my units up in the exponent all disappear, right? Uh, I can't do E to the kilojoule power, for example. That doesn't make any physical sense whatsoever. Uh, so I'm gonna take my activation energy out of kilojoules per mole and I'm gonna put it into joules per mole because then I can use R in joules per mole to uh, take care of that. So up here, I'm gonna say I have 85,500 joules per mole. And I'm going to divide that by R in joules is 8.314. That's got units of joules per Kelvin per mole. That's Kelvin mole and not kilomole, uh, by the way. And then I need a temperature, uh, which is 298K. Uh, I need one more parenthesis, I guess, for that. And if I multiply that out, we'll see that I go down to 4.46 times 10 to the minus 32, uh, still in per meter cubed, still in meters cubed rather per second. Okay, uh, so we shrunk this a lot by saying that activation energy comes into play, right? Uh, at 298K, that's not that hot, right? And so the relative speeds of my molecules are such that most of the collisions clearly do not have enough energy to make it over that 85 kilojoule barrier. Uh, there's a note in my solution uh, page here that says, uh, experimentally, the actual value of P for this reaction is about 0.2, uh, which means that my rate constant uh, would be divided by another factor of five uh, from what's up there right now to do that, okay? This table just has a look at uh, some uh, actual experimental data for different things, okay? And so uh, on top, uh, that's actually what? That's sort of the reverse of the uh, reaction that we were just playing with. Uh, it's written as two NOCLs uh, making those because it's got to be a bimolecular collision on the left-hand side is why it's written in that kind of awkward way. Uh, but uh, this says what? Uh, it says the experimental value uh, of the pre-exponential factor uh, is written in the, uh, the, the first column of, of numbers there, right? Uh, the second column is theoretical values. So this theoretical value, uh, these, uh, this is this K2 max, essentially, that we've been talking about, right? Uh, these are activation energies here. And then the result is 
uh, if you take those and uh, say, what does P have to be the P that's over here, uh, this is effectively going to be something like the, uh, the ratio of the, fir the first two columns, right? So my P's here are going to be the experiment over the theory uh, for the K values, right? Because that says what fraction of the things that we said should matter actually are showing up. Okay, uh, and if we look down there, we can see what uh, the one on top uh, is at least on the same order as one, right, at, at 0.16. Uh, if I go down to the second one, uh, now I've gotten a lot smaller, right? That says uh, to have that happen, uh, I probably have to have the right orientation of the two molecules, and it says not that many collisions do that. Uh, the third reaction on my list says I'm adding hydrogen to ethylene to make ethane. Uh, that one has a smaller still probability. Uh, in this case, I kind of need to get that hydrogen molecule uh, so that I'm going to be able to add a hydrogen to each of the two sides of the double bond. That apparently requires some particular arrangement. The last reaction on this list is a fascinating one, right? It says uh, potassium plus Br2, uh, and it says the experimental rate constant uh, is actually bigger than the theoretical rate constant, right? Uh, it also says this reaction really does have zero activation energy uh, because, well, you might imagine that potassium atom is going to be pretty reactive, right? Uh, if I just have a potassium atom coming uh, and it uh, approaches a bromine molecule, all those electrons are going to be uh, of, uh, of interest there, right? Uh, and I'm going to be easily making the, uh, the ion pair where the, the bromine is going to take the electron from the uh, potassium, uh, make the KBr. My steric factor here is bigger than one. That shouldn't be able to happen, right? Uh, that says those molecules seemingly don't even have to hit each other in order to get to react. Uh, because of that, there's a, a somewhat playful name given to this uh, phenomenon, which happens for several reactions. Uh, and it's referred to as taking place by what, uh, what people often call a harpoon mechanism. Uh, and although this is a little bit esoteric, I think it's just kind of a fun topic. And I, I left this in here. Uh, last year's class actually got really interested in this. And so in the posted slides, uh, there's a little bit more that I'm going to show uh, in the slides here, uh, because I sort of followed up uh, the class after I had ended with this, because people had asked a lot of questions about it. So how can this kind of harpoon mechanism work? It doesn't seem physically like it should, should be a thing that can happen, right? So the first step is I need to transfer an electron from potassium to bromine because I'm going to make KBr. That means I need K plus, right? Uh, this electron transfer, that's the part that turns out not to actually require an act of a collision, right? Uh, the bromine's got, uh, the, the potassium's got a small ionization energy, right? Uh, and well, a really lousy or small electronegativity. Uh, the bromine, on the other hand, is, is, is very uh, uh, anxious to take on electrons, right? It turns out we can actually pull an electron off of the potassium from a distance uh, and form our K plus ion, right? Once I make K plus and then I have, at least in the near term, I have Br2 minus, those are ions, right? And so once they're ions, the idea that they don't exert strong forces on one another is just no longer in play. Right? Because if they're both ions and they're pretty close together already, then the Coulomb force is going to reel them in. Right? So the electron is the harpoon. It reaches out uh, to the passing by, uh, in this case, bromine molecule. And then that uh, Coulomb force is what, what reels in the harpoon uh, and brings this together. So I end up with a reaction rate uh, that's actually higher than the collision frequency. Okay? Uh, that's a somewhat peculiar and totally unexpected kind of result. Uh, it does happen for a number of reactions, all of which can be looked at as involving something like electron transfer, like this one here. Okay, uh, You can figure out something about how this works. The extra slides that are in the posted material uh, does things like taking uh, things like the ionization energy of the uh, potassium and figuring out some things about the probabilities of this taking place. Uh, it's just kind of a really, really peculiar thing uh, that happens, and it demonstrates that this sort of first order thinking that says, well, they have to at least touch each other to react. That is true for the vast majority of reactions, Okay, uh, but there are also a couple of uh, strange cases like this one that uh, sort of break beyond that uh, and really challenge our, our ways of thinking about this uh, to come up with an explanation. And it turns out it, it does make sense uh, if you start thinking about things like the ionization energies of the, the particles involved and, and uh, things of that sort. All right, uh, that's a quick introduction to collision theory. Okay, uh, we could do some of those things in a lot more detail, uh, but that gives you kind of the general underpinnings of how we can go about 
uh, thinking about these sorts of things uh, to get kind of more of a, a first principles approach on how rate constants should behave. Thanks.